Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Pacoon by Spike Milligan. So I don't think this actually has a blurb, which is kind of unsurprising because it doesn't really have a plot. Um, Spike Milligan is, a, is like a humorous writer, and so all of the humour just comes from all this surreal stuff that's going on, you know? Dane reads. So uh, I'm just going to go through and check out some of my tabs, then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating with you at the end. I see my face is no longer red. It wasn't sorted itself out for some reason. Anyway, whatever. Forward. This damn book nearly drove me mad. I started it in 1958 and doodled with it for four years. I don't think I could go through it all again, therefore, as this will be my first and last novel, I would like to thank those who helped me to get it finished. Blah, 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 blah. And uh, he also thanks the human race for being the butt of all of his jokes. This isn't actually his only novel. He also wrote one called The, the, the Fool? The Idiot? I can't remember now. Uh, we get a quote here from Paul Robeson, whose music I greatly admire. In an attempt to break the white man's supremacy, Paul Robeson had once remarked, all handsome men are slightly sunburned. And we get a description here of a character called Murphy. Uh, the main character is called Milligan, but it's not Spike Milligan, it's just like a, one of the humour devices in it. So we get, oh ho, Milligan's voice showed recognition. It's Murphy. Tell me, why are you wearing that terrible looking trilby? We sold the hat stand and there's no place to hang it. I'm trying to do Irish, that wasn't Irish, that was more Scottish. Murphy's face was a replica of the King Edwards he grew. He did in fact look like King Edward VII. He also resembled King Edward III, V and II, making a grand total of King Edward XVII. He had a mobile face, that is, he always took it with him. His nose was what the French call retrousse, or as we say, like a pig. His nostrils were so acutely angled, in stormy weather the rain got in and forced him indoors. His eyebrows grew from his head like giant koipu rats, but, dear friends, when you and I talk of eyebrows, we know not what eyebrows be until we come face to face with the Murphy's eyebrows. The man's head was a veritable plague of eyebrows. Black, grey, brown and red they grew, thick as thieves. They covered two-thirds of his skull. In dry weather, they bristled from his head like the spears of an avenging army, and careless flies were impaled by the score. In winter, they glistened with hoarfrost and steamed by the fire. When wet, they hung down over his eyes, and he was put to shaking himself like a cocker spaniel before he could proceed. For all their size, those eyebrows were as mobile as piglets, and in moments of acute agitation had been seen as far south as his chin. At the first sight of Milligan, they had wagged up and down, agitati man on troppo. As he spoke, they both began to roll around his head at speed. And here we have... A drawing of Murphy. Sp signed T-A-M, because um, I think Spike's, Spike's first name is actually Terence. I don't know his middle name. There's a great, great thing here. <laughs> well, he thought, you can fool some of the people all the time, and all the people some of the time, which is just long enough to be President of the United States. We get an N-bomb, which isn't unusual for Milligan, unfortunately. He picked up a lot of his casual racism from uh, the British Army, I think. You just sort of have to try and look past it, I guess, when you read his work. And here we get... Um, a conversation between the author and character, it kind of gets meta like that. And uh, the uh, character's not happy with the way that Milligan described his legs and he says, Then why are they still like a pair of dirty old pipe cleaners? It's a transitional period. Look, I don't want transitional legs. He stood in the middle of the leaping bodies and spoke. What's this book all about? Here we are on page, page. He looked down. On page 74 and all these bloody people coming and going, where's it all going to end? And uh, it is on page 74, which must have been a nightmare for typesetting, especially if they did different editions. Because like these days you could just like automate it and the computer would automatically update it, but not so much here. I like this here at the start of chapter 7. The funeral of Dan Doonan came treacle slow from the church. Benedictus Deus, e Peter Domini, Nostri Jesus Christi, Peter Misericordium e Deus, chanted Father Rudden, walking on ahead. As long as he said something in the Latin, they all thought they were getting value for money. As a young priest, it bothered him that the faithful never took the trouble to learn the meaning of Latin prayers. As a test, and under the influence of an overdose of whiskey, he had intoned the whole of a dirty story in Latin, which concluded with a solemn amen from the congregation. And we get, again, just a great bit of humour here, so they're trying to bury this guy. And uh, we get, not quite finished yet, sir. You intend to bury an Irish citizen in what is now British territory. That is true. The delay bought cries from the procession. Hurry up, it's gonna rain. Get a move on before another of us passes on. I got bad legs, mister. Barrington waited patiently, then continued. I presume the deceased will be staying this side permanently. Unless someone invents a remarkable drug, yes, answered the, answered the priest. So he needs, uh, he needs, he needs to get a passport. So they have to take him off to this guy to photograph him. And um, I want to read this, this is about the photographer. Arthur Manuel Fadigan hummed the Rose of Tralee, screwed the top of his pie ointment and pulled up his trousers. The photographic trade in Ireland had been hard hit since the migration to America. Only the mad Mrs. Bridie Chandler from the great ruined farm on the moor ever sat for him. Once a week she came galloping up, a great mountain of fat astride a black stallion. Sweeping into the studio, she'd strip off her clothes and shout, Take me! 
The first time had been shock enough. Fadigan had run all the way to church. Father, he gasped, is it wrong to look at naked women? Of course it is, said Rodin, otherwise we'd all be doing it. He had finally given Fadigan a dispensation to photograph her, providing he kept at a respectable distance. Fadigan never did work out how much that was in feet and inches, and he never did comprehend how a woman could spread out in so many directions at once and still stay in the same place. His wife arrived one day when he was printing the negatives and beat him silly with a bottle of best developing fluid at 23 shillings a pint. You dirty pornographer, she said and left him for good. The small green shop bell tinkled briefly and in came three men with a dangling dandunum. Is he drunk? inquired Mr. Fadigan. No, no, said one of the dancer boys. He's got leg trouble. What's his head hanging down for? He's got leg trouble right up to his neck. Oh, just sit him on the chair. Dunan slid to the floor. Whoops a daisy, said Fadigan, slime kindly. We want passport photos. Is he going away then? Yes. Where to? We're not sure, but he's got a choice of two places. Because obviously he's getting buried. He's either going to heaven or hell. So we get this little bit here again relating to the border. And this is interesting to me because this happens in some pubs in the UK. Um, where like pubs are over different counties and stuff and they used to have different licensing laws and this is basically a reflection of that. Any more? Asked the priest peering around. No? Yes! Mrs O'Toole jumped to his feet. This battery affects me terribly. My pub is all in this side of the border, all except two square feet in the far corner of the public bar. Is that a hardship? Asked Father Rudden. Is it? That two square feet is an ulster where the price of drinks is 30% cheaper. Now every night my pub is empty save for a crowd of bloody skin flints all huddled in that corner like Scrooges. Father Rudden promised a solution and closed the meeting. Again, apologies for my Irish accent. Doing my best. And then we get this which um, is kind of typical of the kind of thing that, that Milligan says and um, like some of those sort of problematic views I guess that um, that, that, you know, are very much out of fashion in, in, in this day and age. Um, but this is how racists think. Nice, yes, Bane, but consider the prospect. If Ah Pong becomes a constable, he's bound to succeed, as the Chinese are very clever. I read that. Now, the inspector pulled the lobe of his nose. He'll write to his relations in Peking and tell them that there is jobs over here with uniforms, lodgings, pay, and allowances. He looked at Bane. Don't you see, Sergeant, if Ah Pong gets in, ten years from now, the entire police force of Ireland would be Chinese. I uh, appreciate the irony of me doing this in an Irish accent. At least I didn't try and do a Chinese accent for our ping. That would be really fuck. Um, we get this bit about some wine. I just love this. Beaujolais, he said phonetically. 1920, a good year. Be a better year when you open it, father. So yeah, that's about all I got for you. The novel Pacoon by Spike Milligan. Oh, I go, I go on. I'm from the deep south now. So that's all I found from this novel Pacoon by Spike Milligan. I read out some of the tabs that I tabbed out and uh, I thought it was pretty good. I gave it a pretty solid 4 out of 5. It's uh, one, of, one of Milligan's better books and uh, it's probably because it's a novel. I, I wasn't too sure if he'd be able to, uh, you know, duplicate his unique style. Uh, where he normally writes in shorter form, but in this one he's writing a bit of longer form and I thought it was pretty good. So I gave it a 4 out of 5. Uh, so there we go. Thank you a lot for watching my booktube channel. As always, uh, don't forget to hit that like button down there and hit that subscribe button for more. Let me know in the comments what you think of these really ridiculous accents I've been doing. I probably won't keep doing these because I'll get cancelled. And Oh, I've, got, I've gone American again. Oh no, I got that was Scottish. I've gone American again. Oh, shit. So yeah, um, yeah, that was what I made of it. I'll see you later. Bye-bye.